Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Alex King and Bill G. Today is Tuesday, July the 30th, 2019. It is 8 a.m. in New York and 5 a.m. in Los Angeles. That's 1 p.m. London time, 9 p.m. in Tokyo, 10 p.m. in Sydney, Australia. But wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today. You're a daily dose of happy, and today is a, kind of a, a happy, sad day because uh, I am dedicating the show to my my mom, who passed over the weekend, she was one month shy of her 90th birthday, so she'd had a good long life. Um, but I was also kind of inspired to talk about uh, her her passing on the show because I, I think there is some really interesting, uh, I don't want to call them lessons, information, pieces of information that I've been getting out of the experience, mm-hmm. um, one of which, kind of to my surprise, was that I, I haven't gone through a grieving process. And I've been asking myself, well, am I burying it? You know, am I, am I like blocking it in some way? And I realized, no, I'm not. What's actually happened is I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm actually okay with her passing. And, mm-hmm. um, it's not that I didn't love my mom. I did. Uh, but you know, she quite honestly, the last time I saw her was last September mm-hmm. when Louise and I drove down to Virginia to our niece's wedding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mom was not in good shape at all. She, uh, my, my sister's been taking care of her. Um, PJ has been great as a caregiver, I have to say. And it, it was really evident to me. It was really obvious to me. My mom didn't want to be here. Mm. She was done. She mm-hmm. was done nine months ago. Mm. And in fact, we got her, my, my sister started taking care of her a year ago this month. Mm. We bought, we got a house for her to live in so that my sister could take care of her in the house. And I remember having a conversation with my sister. My sister was, we were talking about how to handle financial situations and, you know, what happens if uh, she needs nursing care and all this kind of stuff, you know, things you Mm -hmm. have to discuss. And in the course of it, I I made the comment, you know, I I get the feeling mom might not live a year. Mm -hmm. And PJ was saying, well, I'm getting all these uh, psychic messages saying that she's going to be around two or three years or whatever. I said, oh, well, okay. Well, it turns out she lasted a year. And, well, actually, one of the questions I asked myself was, does this mean that I actually was psychic? (laughs) Was I actually (laughs) picking this up? And the answer is, I have no idea. I have no clue whatsoever. But let's just say I got this one right. Well, we'll leave it at that. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, yeah, and, and throughout this entire process of, of changing my, my mom was in a senior center helping her get out of the senior center. My sister, um, needed to get out of the job she was in. So this was a perfect situation for her, uh, to be my mom's caregiver for the past year. And, you know, it was just one of those situations that worked out well. Um, but all that time I kept thinking to myself, mom doesn't want to be here. Mm-hmm. So it's so mm-hmm. obvious and it reinforces for me what Abraham Hicks teaches us, which is we all choose when we're going to leave, yeah. which is very contrary to what we humans tend to believe. Mm-hmm. But boy, this has really hammered that home for me because I mean, I, I, you could almost see her just kind of go into death mode. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, uh, there's no other nice way of saying it. I mean, she, she yeah. was literally killing herself off with her thoughts. I mean, and she was in a really negative space all this time. Mm. You know, that, and that's exactly what Abraham teaches us. You know, you, you focus on stuff that you don't like and you're going to end up getting yourself sick or worse, which is exactly what happened. She made herself very, very sick. She ended up um, having cancer um, and dying from that. And I, it was it was so obvious. So I, I'm, I, I mean, it's it sounds macabre to say this, but I'm really grateful to my mom for doing this because she provided a beautiful example of exactly how we do what Abraham tells us that, that we tend to do. Mm-hmm. It was really something. So the other part of this is that for most people, mo- losing a parent or another close family member, especially if they're younger, is often a very traumatic experience. Mm-hmm. Um, especially you know, the younger the person is, the more traumatic it tends to be. Um, yeah. Joel has spoken eloquently about how he lost his adopted son, TJ, at the age of 21, I believe it was. Mm-hmm when TJ was involved in a traffic accident and how he has gone through uh, a whole lot of growth and a whole lot of, of understanding about the nature of life, the nature of death, the nature of all this through TJ's passing. doesn't mean for a second that he doesn't miss his son. He does. 
He says he thinks about him every single day, but he's learned so much from it. And he's learned, among other things, to appreciate life as a result mm-hmm. of it. And I keep thinking, I, every time he told that story, I thought the same thing that I'm thinking now. Like, wow, that's really what we need to remember. Um, we do it to an extent in that we talk about, many of us, when people pass, we talk about the how wonderful their lives were, the, what, you know, the good things that they, they said, they did, you know, their accomplishments, what kind of people they were and so forth. And, that, and that's a great way to celebrate. Um, I like, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, let's take that a step further. Let's make celebration of their lives an ongoing thing in terms of celebrating our own lives and mm-hmm. celebrating the lives of our friends. Mm-hmm. This, in my view, that's why we're here. We're here to enjoy life. Yeah. We're, we're here to feel good. We're here to, uh, kind of to have a good time, I guess you could say. So, <laughs> so, so, so I mean, th- these are just some of the, the random thoughts that, that have been going through my mind the last few days since my sister called and told me what had happened. Um, mm-hmm. interestingly enough, I think we're both kind of going through it the same way. My mm-hmm. brother has had more of an emotional reaction than the two of us, which in and of itself is just amazing because my brother was always the one who was emotionally more distant than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> And in a positive way, I must say, he, no. mm-hmm. he's, he's, just, mm-hmm. he's handling it very positively. But it's just, it's just a fascinating experience to go through, and and that's not the usual words you hear from somebody who just lost their mom. But that's yeah. that's the way I'm feeling about it. So, mm-hmm. I want to thank you guys. You guys both sent me emails expressing your your thoughts and condolences and so forth. And I want to thank you very much. And in advance of anyone who's listening who uh, wants to do the same thing, um, I appreciate that as well. Um, but rest assured, I'm actually doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, why? Uh, well, the, what you described to me is very similar to uh, what happened with my um, my great aunt, my grandmother, and my grandfather. Mm. Uh, my grandfather passed away in '92 with from uh, Parkinson's and uh, a um, uh, skin cancer. And um, for the last three years of his life, he was preparing to die. He mm-hmm. uh, he was making sure all the finances were in order. Uh, he was an accountant. Uh, and he was in a, a great deal of pain and the Parkinson's was getting worse. And he just, at that point, he was like, all right, I'm ready to go. And so he made all of the arrangements. And then when he finally passed, it was, a, it, you know, it, it, it was a relatively quick passing. Mm. And then, um, my, my great aunt, who's, who was his sister, when she got to be 93, 94, um, every time we would, meet up with her. She was like, I have no idea why I'm still here. Why am I still here? <laughs> <laughs> she was living in a nursing home at the time. No one very, people rarely visited her. Uh, all her friends were gone and she didn't have any kids. And she was like, you know, you know, I am so ready. <laughs> it, it reminds me, there, there's a British telecom um, series that was on back in the nineties, I think called waiting to waiting for God. It was, for God. <laughs> it, it, it was a story of this curmudgeonly old woman who was, you know, just berating everything about her life and, and couldn't believe that she was still alive. And, and the series, I don't know how many episodes they had, but yeah. every single episode was the same thing about, you know, how frustrated she was that she was still mm-hmm. alive. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, actually, you know, and again, it was a relatively quick passing. She, once she got sick, she, it was very, it was relatively quick. Uh, and then there's my grandmother. My grandmother, uh, was scared to death to die. Mm. And she, right after a knee surgery, she had a, a, a really bad stroke mm-hmm. uh, to the point where she did, she lost pretty much most of her faculties. And she lived for almost 15 years in that condition. Whoa. With my parents taking care of her as, oh. as their full time caregivers. And the thing is, and when we checked with Spirit on it, she was like, it was like, she's just terrified to die. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And because she was so terrified to die, it took a long, long time mm-hmm. for her to finally pass. And she was miserable the entire time. But again, she, because she was scared of it, yeah, kept it, kept it at bay all that time. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it, it, it goes both ways. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and you know, and you, you go to, if you visit nursing homes and whatever, and you see, you can see the, both of those things happening. Some people oh, go yes. into a nursing home and they are, they pass within one year, even if they go in in relatively good health. Mm-hmm. And then there are other people who are there for decades. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are people who go into hospice and they die the next day. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Including my father-in-law. Right. That's mm. what happened with him. I mean, he, 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 his last couple of years of life, he was medically not in a happy place. He was pretty, pretty miserable, but he, I think he knew what his time right. was because he, he basically got, it was Christmas. <laughs> happy oh. Mer- Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> right, right. And, and Chris, Christmas Eve, leading into Christmas morning in the middle of the night, my wife woke me up. We were visiting. My wife woke me up and they need help tending to him. So I helped tend to him. And the next day they took him to hospice care because the hospice worker said, yeah, he's, he's not going to be around real long. They took him there and the next morning he died. I mean, it was just bang. Mm-hmm. Like wow. Yeah. Really, really quick. And it reminds me of a, there was a South Park episode way back. I used to watch that show. It was her. It was terrible. But uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're having a birthday party for the grandfather. It's like, what do you wish for a grandpa? I wish I were dead. <laughs> yeah, South oh, Park, uh, South Park definitely won the award for irreverence. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, humor does play a role in all this too. It is about recognizing what really goes on. We, the, the, the great lesson here for me, if, if you want to call it a lesson, is that what we can now understand about how we die, that we get to, that we actually do choose how long we're going to stay, how long we're going to leave, you know, when we're going to leave and so forth, also is an indication that we get to choose how we can live. And you know, for people who might be asking themselves, well, how could you go through loss of a parent without feeling you know, bereavement on it? I think I know what the answer is. The answer mm-hmm. is study your own connection to universal source. Mm-hmm. Get to know how the whole thing works. Get to know how source energy works. Get to know how the law of attraction works. Mm-hmm. And in that study, you you just you reach a place of calm. Mm-hmm. Place that's what I've experienced. Yeah. Have you have, do you experienced that, Alex? Um, I went through this with my grandmother, and I was very very close to my grandmother. Even I like to the point where she had dementia, but every time I talked to her, she was lucid. Oh, wow. I, yeah. So it's like other people will tell them like, oh, I just talked to Grammy and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> I was like, she's totally fine with dementia my ass. Anyway, <laughs> she's faking it with y'all. I'm telling you, she's totally lucid every time I talk to her. Anyway, so, but she always had this thing where she felt like I needed her. So mm. she's, she, you know, always said to her nurses, oh, I got to go because I got to, I got to talk to my granddaughter. She needs me because she has this and this and this. And I'm like, first of all, stop spreading my business. <laughs> I don't know these people. Goodness. But yeah, she was always the one who like, even from when I was like ugh, a teenager, she would always say to my mother and, and all of us, you know, oh, you don't have time to spend with me now. I hope you have time to make it to my funeral. And it's like, oh, wow. really? Like, but that's how she was with everybody. So, <laughs> yeah. So when she passed, I was like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that I hated her or no. anything, but it's like my, my mother, you know, was her only child left. So all the pressure went to her and my, my grandmother did not treat my mother very well. So she oh. literally, she's like, I feel like a weight is lifted off my chest. No. Oh. And so she was, she was in good spirits and that made me in good spirits. But at the same time, I was just like, she's 96. I mean. And kudos to your mom. Cause cause your mom could have taken that the other direction very easily. She could turn that into, she's been treating me miserable all my life. And now I'm really pissed because I never got to give it back to her or, you know, whatever, some other thing like that. And she chose not. Well, a situation went down where I gave it back to my grandmother on behalf of my mother because I heard something live and in person and I didn't like it one bit. Uh-huh. I stopped talking to my grandmother for like a month and she's like, you haven't called me. And I was like, listen, let me tell you about, tell you something, lady. Okay. <laughs> I, <don't appreciate laughs> I was like, my mother does everything and anything for you and you treat her like garbage. And that's your only daughter. Like, this is so disrespectful. I can't right now. So she was blown away that I was speaking to her like that, first of all. Second of all, she she felt really bad to the point where she called my mother and she was like, she didn't out and apologize. No, that would be too much. She, no, no, that's not, that's above her. So, <laughs> so she, but she did go on to say that you have a very loving daughter and to kind of twisted it into the way where like, I wish I had the same thing, like backhanded comments every which way. <laughs> so when, like I said, when she was gone, everybody was like, all right, cool. So anyways, what are we going to have for lunch now? <laughs> yeah, seriously. 
<laughs> and when the memorial came around, like, my mother was the only one who went, and she went, like, out of guilt, but, like, because the, the church kept calling her, like, are you coming? Are you coming? And she's like, I don't really want to go over the bridge, but, I mean, <laughs> I'll be the only family member representing, so I guess I'll go. And I was, I was like, sorry, not sorry. I'm not going. <laughs> but, yeah, so her whole church was there, but I feel like, Mm, that was uh for to save face because she wasn't a nice person. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. but when my great aunt died, um, I don't get emotional with death, but I was I did know when she passed, she, even though she we were in not in two separate states, but like she was in Boston and I'm on the Cape, and 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 she literally I felt her come visit me. Oh wow! As soon as she passed, yeah, like my dog started barking, and I was like, it was like two o'clock in the morning, and I'm like why are you barking? And he's like, he's just staring at me and he's staring at in the hallway. And I was like, and then something came over and it was like, Aunt Ditta. I knew it was Aunt Ditta. And then two minutes later, my uncle called and was like, Aunt Ditta passed. I was like, I know. Like, yeah. I was like, yeah, she was just here. He was like, what? I was like, no, you don't get it. It's cool. But yeah, she, she definitely came to visit, came to see me one last time. Um, but yeah, she was, she was having a rough death. Like she, wasn't the, because they were so spiritual. They, the both of them, they were they weren't afraid to die. Uh, but she was hanging on for some reason. I don't know what it was. I, I, I'll never know, obviously. But um, yeah, she did, couldn't answer the phone for the last couple of days, and that's when I knew I was like, okay, it's coming. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. it happened. Interesting also, you should say that 96. too. Yeah. Also, ninety six. Both of them. Also wow. 90, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You should mention though about. Uh, knowing it was coming. I, I didn't have an experience of, of a spirit, you know, coming up against me and all that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But when my sister called on Saturday, as soon as I saw her number, I said, my mom's dying. Yeah. And it was actually, she was already gone. You know, mm-hmm. but that, that mm-hmm. was like the first thought that came to my mind. Yeah. Now why? I have no idea. I can't yeah. tell you why. It just actually, did. I, actually, well, when you asked the question, am I psychic? I checked it. And I get, and I got, a, I got a thumbs up on that one. <laughs> Well, okay. <laughs> nice to know. I don't know what to do with that, but <laughs> I still haven't figured out which one are the psychic messages and which ones are, you know, pulling the wool over the eyes. I have no idea yet. <laughs> well, it, 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 it comes from, you know, higher wisdom and it mm-hmm. comes from, you know, and, and sometimes we just know things, uh, you know, because yeah. we feel the currents of the energy. Um, you know, I think and, a lot of it is reproducibility. Like I, I no. can't easily reproduce that. In that particular mm. case, I, I, I just kind of knew, but mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know what to do with it, and I didn't know how to reproduce it, and I, uh, well, okay, so I know, what do I do? You know, what, what do you do with that information? <laughs> like, right. okay, well, you just kind of wait to see what the news is, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> There's nothing yeah, else like, to be done. <laughs> like, every time I used to call my parents, they're like, okay, how much money do you need? <laughs> 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 I'm not that. I'm not sure if that's psychic or financial, but either way. <laughs> no, that's just knowing your children. That's yeah, what exactly. That <laughs> like, what? I can't call you and say hello. <laughs> yeah, hello and <laughs> hello and. <laughs> it's like improv class. <laughs> well, hello and is better than hello but. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, it also, this is an interesting experience in that it reminds me of my father's passing. He passed, mm-hmm. um, let's see, 11 years ago, March. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the memorial service for that was, from my, from my perspective, was freaky. I've talked about this before. Yeah. It, it was freaky because, again, I wasn't in mourning. Mm-hmm. None of my family were. And, mm-hmm. and the first freaky moment was when we were, we were at the church where the service was being held mm-hmm. and we were in um, what they call their upper room and we were meeting with their church minister and mm-hmm. it was our family and him and we we're just in this room and we're chatting, we're chatting about all kinds of stuff, we're chatting about dad, we're chatting about things going on and so forth and after about 15 minutes of it, I'm looking at the minister, he's got this really weird look on his face and I said, oh my god, he's here to comfort us and we don't need comforting. <laughs> <laughs> It finally dawned on me what we were doing in that room. I, it hadn't even occurred to me. That's why we were there. Right, right. You know? And I, I've, again, I've talked about this on the show before, but um, he went during the service. He 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 went on and on about how strong the faith of our family was, which I was laughing at because almost none of us were churchgoers. But, 
I mean, I had to—I literally had the hand over the mouth routine. That's how how close I was to just bursting out laughing in the middle in the middle of my father's memorial service, you know. <laughs> but but it was it was surreal because I, in my dad's case, I did do some mourning, but I did it all before he died. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. And then after he died, I said, "Well, okay, so where's the grief?" Right, right. Like. Am I being cheated here? <laughs> <laughs> well, grief's a funny thing uh, mm-hmm. because it's different for every person and it's different yes. for every person who passes in your life. Mm. Uh, you know, when my grandfather passed, I didn't feel any grief at all. Mm-hmm. But when my grandmother passed, at first I was relieved because I knew how long she was holding on and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then at the memorial, it just hit me like a wave. And I'm wow. like, wow, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm happy. And uh, my uh, Nina is uh, uh, clairvoyant, so she sometimes hears, um, especially the recently departed, uh, mm-hmm. because their, their energy is still pretty strong. And um, she attended the, 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 uh, the memorial. Uh, so she was there, and she was laughing the entire time. <laughs> Because the minister was up there talking about, you know, what happens when you pass. He's like, "Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. It's like, how would you know? (laughs) I'm sorry, have you done this before? Like. Well, actually, I had a second reading that said I'd done this 1,700 times before, so, you know. (laughs) But it's like your birth. You don't remember. Like like I said, yeah. (laughs) Good thing I'm not an accountant. I'd be going crazy trying to do the uh, the uh, the audit on that to find out what's it actually 1,700 times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, she was. Um, um, I remember. You know, it was toward the end of the service. She comes over and she whispers in my ear. And she's like, "Your grandmother's laughing her head off. <laughs> Maybe I should keep that to myself." I was like, "Yeah, yeah. yeah. probably a good idea." Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> that's that's going to be an inside joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there is a certain etiquette to memorial services, isn't there? Right. <laughs> a little bit. Not in our family, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Let me tell you, the repass was all we do is talk smack about the dead. Like, oh, really? Like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> like, remember that time she burnt the butt cake? Like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> the house sank for a week. It was terrible. <laughs> like, like, all we do. But it's it's to make, it, make ourselves laugh and just remember... That life is not that serious. Like, just mm-hmm. don't take mm-hmm. it too seriously, you know? Right. Because yeah. it, it's fleeting, clearly, if you're if we're sitting at a funeral. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that, I think it's exactly the right attitude. Because with that mm-hmm. attitude, that that's the attitude of appreciating life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the real reason why those of us who kind of do the work end up not feeling deep levels of grief. Mm-hmm. Right. Because we understand at, yeah. the, at, at the most fundamental level, life is about joy. Right. Yeah. It's not about suffering. Mm-hmm. It's not about pain. It's not about anger. It's not about fear. It's not about any of that stuff that we don't like. It's about the stuff that we like. Yeah. That's why we're here. The, the ultimate question, why Why are we here? That's the answer. All due respect to Douglas Adams, that is the answer. Yes. <laughs> 42. <laughs> 42. 42. Right? <laughs> I thought it was 23. No, no, 42. No, it's, it's 42. Yeah. Uh, what do you get? And the, the, the ultimate question was, what do you get when you multiply six by nine? Yep. Mm-hmm. And the conclusion is six times nine, 42. No wonder the universe is so screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Douglas Adams and South Park would have gotten along really, really well. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I really do believe that the most important thing is getting ourselves into that space of understanding who we are, where we come from. Because the more that we work on ourselves that way, the easier it is to handle death. And more importantly, the easier it is to handle life. Right. Yes, yes. So many people go through life not knowing how to handle life. And that included me for a good number of decades. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. But I'm glad that I finally learned it. I had some good teachers. I've had mm-hmm. some good experience. But... I'm finally learning. It's like, yeah, life's for living. Life's for joy. Um, one of my favorite, well, I'm sorry, one of my wife's favorite movies is a movie that came out two years back um, called Momentum Generation, story of, of, of surfers. 
they, they, they were the top surfers in the world, and they were all best friends who grew up together. In oh, yeah, you told Hawaii. me about that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And that movie included a death. One of the surfers drowned, mm-hmm. and he was like one of the leads, so to speak. But that group of people, after that death, they went through a very dark period. All of them, they were, every single one of them was, was just spiraling out of control in mm-hmm. all way terms. Mm-hmm. And then one of them, the one who some of them considered to be the worst in a sense, mm-hmm. he's the one who won all the world titles. He was the one who was the best surfer and all that kind of thing. But he was also in their view, a little bit snobbish about it and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. He's the one who reconnected them all. Mm-hmm. Right? And in their reconnection, they discovered that all that really mattered was the surfing. It wasn't the championships. It was the surfing and their friendship and how they're all connected. And now they stay connected all year long. They connect literally. They have this thread that this guy started a few years back um, in text messaging. And that thread continues to this day. Every single day they check in with each other by text. And there's mm-hmm. a group of like, I don't know, 20 of them, something like that. And they're mm-hmm. all connecting by a text every single day to check in with each other to see how they're doing. Yep. The group chat is lit. The group chat is lit. It is. Well, those are guys who really came to understand that life is about love. It's about joy. It's about mm-hmm. friends. It's about caring. It's about the stuff that's really important to us. Mm-hmm. So when we learn that, death becomes really easy. Right. What uh, What was the name of that movie again? Momentum Generation. Momentum. Wow. I actually found something that the spoiler alert girl hadn't seen. Wow. It's a movie, not a show. Nice try. Oh, that's right. You're more TV shows. That's right. <laughs> there are, and let's be honest, there are a lot of movies that get published every year. So uh, it's, yeah. It, uh, it, yeah. It, it's not like you can, I mean, you could watch a movie every single day and still miss half of them. Right. Cause there's, right. there's, there's the box office ones. Then there's like indie ones. Then there's, there's ones that, you know, Netflix ones and there's all kinds of different genres of movies and it's, it goes on forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. It does. Yeah. No, no doubt about that. I think I became at peace with death when I saw, um, we were just talking about the other day, what, um, what, what dreams may come. Uh, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. The Robin Williams movie. Yes. Underrated movie, if you ask me. It is. Very yeah. underrated. I'm like, you guys aren't appreciating the beauty of this movie. Like, no one is understanding what this means. Ugh. Well, when it first came out, I remember what it was like at that time. And that was at a time where there was a lot less spiritual development in the sense that the three of us understand it. Yeah. And a lot more spiritual uh, development in, in say the Christian sense or the major mm-hmm. religion sense. Mm-hmm. And that movie flew in the face of major religion. Mm. It, it, it didn't match up with major religious teaching. So it wasn't appreciated for mm-hmm. that reason. And I think that's, that's why it flew under the, the radar for so many years. I, I think it, it's it's one of those things that it could even become a cult movie at some point. It hasn't really, but it could. Mm-hmm. Just as people develop and as they become more and more tied to what I might call a true spiritual thing rather than something, you know, religiously driven or something. Mm-hmm. I think more and more people will appreciate the movie if they know about it. If they don't know yeah. about it, then it, it won't make any difference. <laughs> but if, if they know about it. I want to say to our, our listeners, if you're going through the five stages of grief right now, watch What Dreams May Come. It'll make you feel a lot better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I can also tell you another way to deal with the five stages of grief. Mm-hmm. Because I accidentally discovered how to use it with my wife. Mm-hmm. My wife's stepmother, who she did not get along with early mm-hmm. on, but later developed a really good relationship with. When she died... Um, Let's see, she died, I guess it was two or three summers ago. I can't remember exactly which. But the following January, I believe it was, I, I saw her one day and she was practically in tears. And I could just, you know, you, you could tell that the person's suffering, that she that, that, that she's really hurting. And I said, what's going on? She says, I, it just it just kind of overwhelmed me that I can't talk to Ruth anymore. She used to call her every Wednesday yeah. and have a conversation with her. It just kind of overwhelmed her. And, and she was in tears and she was losing it. And mm-hmm. I had no idea what to do other than I wanted to help her. Yeah. And now here's one of those psychic moments. This is where you're kind of guided, right? Because I, mm-hmm. I, I had no pre-planning of this at all. Mm-hmm. But I, I just found we have a sectional couch and my wife usually likes to sit in the corner where the, you know, the two pieces come together. We, yeah. And I just went over toward that corner and I knelt in front of her and I put my hands on her lap and I actually took her hands in mine and I said, 
you know, there's a question I never asked you. And I didn't even know what the question was going to be as I was saying it. It just was coming out. But that's how you roll. <laughs> well, that's yeah, exactly. That's what happened. I said, you know, I don't think I ever asked you this question before, but what was it you really loved about Ruth? Mm-hmm. And my wife stopped crying. <laughs> and a look came over her face. And she started talking about what she loved about Ruth. Mm-hmm. And within about 30, now, of course, my wife is a former psychotherapist, right? Yeah. Within, within about a minute after that, she says, I want to congratulate you. You just did something the therapists have been trying to do for years. They've been trying to figure out how to help clients skip all five steps and go right to acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I said, I did? How did I do that? <laughs> oh, God. And what I learned out of that was if you're in grief, the quickest way out of grief is to focus on what you love because yeah. the thing that's hurting is focusing on the loss. Right. And mm-hmm. if you take your mind off of the loss, Abraham again, right? Take your yeah. mind off the thing you don't want and put it onto what you do want, which is love, remembering what you loved about the person. Mm-hmm. The grief goes away. And it goes yeah. away fast. Mm-hmm. It goes away really fast. Yeah, it's almost instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's mind blowing. I mean, um, my sister in law, Lee, her husband died. I guess it was a year and a half ago. I'm confused on the time frames here, so it may have been two and a half. But anyway, he passed, and we mm-hmm. went to the funeral and so forth. And after the funeral, um, Lee, who is uh, Lee's sister, was kind of you know in, in shock. She was she was drained because I mean they, um, he was Catholic, so it was a whole Catholic wake uh, funeral and everything. Yeah, you know, that'll drain anybody. Mm-hmm. But she, so she was pretty wrung out. And um, now Lee and I have not always had the best relationship, mm-hmm. sometimes contentious at times. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could just see she was kind of needing something. So I just went over and sat next to her and I did the same thing with her. I said, you know, and this was literally true. The only thing I knew about your husband was Joe spoke at our wedding. He, he gave some remarks at the um, uh, beginning of the reception, but I never had a chance. Literally, I never had a chance to talk to him. Mm-hmm. I never had a conversation with him, which I know sounds strange, but you no, know, mm-hmm. I just, I never had a conversation with him. I mm-hmm. only knew about him through what others had told me about him. Right. So right. I said, you know, tell me more about your husband. Tell me, tell me what you loved about him. What, 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 what was it that, you know, you really loved the most and what do you remember the most and so forth? And it was the same thing all over again. Mm-hmm. Her demeanor shifted. She started to smile. She's, and the first words that came out of her mouth were, he made me laugh. Ah. He made me laugh. And then she started so talking sweet, stories about cry. that. Oh, <laughs> And then she started oh. telling stories about how he would make her laugh and, mm-hmm. you know, situations where he made her laugh and, and what happened in those situations and so forth. And yeah. her whole countenance changed. Everything changed. And like you said, it changed just like that. It was so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if you know anybody who's suffering, uh, particularly because they lost a loved one that they were close to, ask them to talk about what they love. And if they yeah. resist it, just keep bringing them back to what, what do they love about that person? Uh, not not in the past tense, but in the present tense, because mm-hmm. they still love them. You know, that person still exists in, in source energy, so it's not like you're lying or anything like that. But mm. what do you love about them right now? That when, when you get somebody to help to focus on that, the grief, the pain just goes away. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, and talking a little bit about um, uh, people who uh, who will themselves to die, or at least you know make themselves sick so that they do pass on because they've had enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do have the occasion of, of meeting with, um, uh, either clients or just people in general who are sick or they have some, or they're in a die, in a dying process. Mm-hmm. And they mm-hmm. ask me the question, why am I still here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm reminded of Richard Bach. Ah. You're here because you still got work to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, they're like, well, what do you mean by that? And it's like, well, who in your life right now needs you? Mm. And they and right away they they can identify somebody that who they are very close to, like a daughter or a granddaughter or 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 a close relative who is in need of their company or need of their advice or whatever. And I said, well, okay, when they don't need you anymore, you know, you, when when you've got them taken care of, this is going to be easy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Isn't it interesting how acceptance plays a role in both life and in death? Mm-hmm. Because when we are unwilling to accept what's going on, we hang on to 
that negative thing. And so the negative thing insists on sticking around right. and even, even rubbing its attention in your face to make things worse. And similarly for people, when they're ready to, to go, they're not willing to accept something, something that's uh-huh. going on. They're not, or they're, or to put it another way, they're not willing to release. Isn't that an interesting thing? Acceptance and release are basically two sides of the same coin, mm-hmm. but they're, they're unwilling to release something, something right. that you know, they're not, they're not willing to accept that, that that person that they they feel so uh, beholden to has their own life can make their own decisions or um, that they're going to be fine or you know, whatever it is. They they, they, they they just have to hang on, hang on, hang on, just yeah. like we do in life. In, in, mm-hmm. in our lifetimes, we hang on, hang on, hang on to the stuff right. that we really, really don't like. But, yeah. my God, I'm going to hang on to this to the end. <laughs> and, and belief pu- puts in is plays a big role in there, too, because there actually are people who pass on, who stick around a little longer. Their, their essence ha- sticks around a little longer mm-hmm. uh, because they are feeling as though their work well, hasn't been done. Right, mm-hmm. right. Because whatever belief they had was strong, is strong enough to keep them from moving on to the next thing. Now, it's rare. Yep. And mm-hmm. I have to emphasize this because some people think, oh, this happens to everybody. No, this no. doesn't happen to everybody. Mm-hmm. I've read enough and I, and I've heard it and I've listened to enough, uh, near death experience stories from people where mm-hmm. coming back is painful and extremely unpleasant. Mm-hmm. Why would anybody <laughs> want to do that? <laughs> So, and the reason why they did that in, in the near death experience uh, community, it's because there was something that they had to do that was so important that it superseded whatever bliss they were receiving on the other side. Mm-hmm. So they did. They had. They actually didn't have a choice. And what happens sometimes is the soul moves on, and then you get it. Then you have a like what you call walk in or a transfer student or whatever who takes over the body. That's fine. That's a whole different. That's a whole different ball of wax. He said transfer student. <laughs> transfer student. Exactly. Well, actually, that's what they're called. <laughs> but no, no, when I hear no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm dead serious there. Um, a well, trans- they, they made a movie about that called Heaven Can Wait. Exactly. Yes, we were talking about it the other day. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That, that's, yeah. Yes, yes. You know, disclosure. So soft disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, uh, so, but, yeah, like I said, that's a whole, that's a whole other realm here um right, talking right specifically about a person and their willingness to move on and in that case you know uh srt does help in that area because you, what you can do is you can connect with that spirit and say you know okay you're done <laughs> 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 you're you're not gonna you're not gonna accomplish anything else here by right. sticking around you, there's there's something on the other side to help you move on to the next step there is a next step you, mm. it's, right it's cool it's cool you can do that uh, but like I said, it's rare. Uh, I do run into it in occasion. Um, but uh, for the most part, <clears throat> anything that when people experience a lot of, um, you know, residual energy from their <clears throat> past loved ones, it's generally a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, an echo of an emotion mm-hmm. that they felt that connected with you personally. It is your connection with them that lives on. Yes. And so um, uh, that's mostly what psychic mediums do is they connect with the connection, Mm -hmm. not necessarily with the person, the person, the other person's soul, because the other person's soul's moved on. They're connecting Mm -hmm. to the connection. They're connecting to the echoes because we've already, we've we've established in, um, in quantum mechanics and whatever that the, um, emotional energy, intentional energy affects matter on, on a subatomic level. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it changes its molecular structure, and you can tap into that. <clears throat> you go into a room where somebody died violently or whatever, you feel something. The room feels cold. Or you, you can, uh, some psychic mediums can actually see the event take place because it's embedded into the atoms of the matter around it and they can pick up on it because they have it's called death echo and so um and so that's uh and you can clear that too you can you know i can can run around a room with a pendulum and also clear that too because again it's just residual energy it's just energy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that's the thing to remember all of this is about just energy right that's what I try to remind myself every day. I try to try to remember all this physical stuff that I see as energy, mm-hmm. and it's hard to remember. Yeah, it is. <laughs> these these uh, illusions are pretty darn good. 
They're, oh, yeah. The Matrix is real, man. Right. And, and then when I realized that we created them, I say, darn, we're good at this stuff. <laughs> we're really good at this stuff. We're yeah. better than we think we are. <laughs> and, and piggybacking on the uh, um, talking about what you loved about a person who has passed on, mm. in a sense, you're acknowledging the good things that they gave you. Mm-hmm. That you are mm-hmm. acknowledging their purpose in your life mm-hmm. because all the good things that they did while they were alive that affected you on a very positive level, that's what they were there for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that you are acknowledging their life's existence. Yes. Um, and, you know, and, uh, you know, when Alex is saying, you know, they, you know, one of the things they badmouth the person who, you know, they, they talk about all the terrible things. <laughs> but but they, that's still, that's still the love. It is. That's yeah, expressing yeah. the love. That's, that's, that's expressing the comedy. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's definitely how we deal with it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's they, wow. They, they, pro- they provided such a nice vivid memory of us. Of, <laughs> they burned down the house. <laughs> Um, I wanted to say that um, think uh, think what when um Bill was talking about um the spirits hanging on because they feel like that that they're needed and stuff like that. This low key reminds me of Nanny McPhee. Yeah. So it's like I feel like now if a kid is dealing with death, like they maybe they should watch Nanny McPhee because I feel like that's like the low key message right there. Sure. Yeah, that would work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it's it's probably more effective. This is my opinion. It's probably more mm-hmm. effective if there's an actual human interaction rather than watching it. Oh, movie. yeah. Yeah, no, no. you got to watch it with a parent, and the parents got to explain, see, this is what happens, like, when you when you need me and, and want me, and or however it goes, if you mm-hmm. know. When you want me and don't need me, I'll be here. When you need me and don't want me, or is it the other way around? One of the yeah. other, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I said it right. I said it right. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's that's when I'll leave. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is interesting. though. That's also Mary Poppins' reference right there. Mm. Well, it was based off of Mary Poppins. It was it just is. a 2000 version because right. <laughs> the new Mary Poppins was trash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Tell us what you really think of it. <laughs> Garbage. <laughs> It just doesn't hold up to the original. Like it just. Right. But it can't. I know it can't. I don't know because Lion King and Aladdin did all right. It, you you and... just love Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Will Smith was not in the Lion King though. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. Will Smith did carry that whole movie. You're right. <laughs> I don't even know the names of the other characters. <laughs> <laughs> I just know them as Aladdin and Jasmine. I am Jafar. That's it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's funny. Talk about uh, taking the stage. Bill will completely control that stage. Facts. Yeah. As he does every time. <laughs> well, Robin Williams took over the stage when he made, did the cartoon version. He, he exactly. Took, he took over the entire control room. Let's be perfectly right. honest. <laughs> Oh, there was other characters in that movie. Right? <laughs> it's not called the genie. I didn't. <laughs> there wasn't a spinoff. <laughs> I just love the description of the um, the cartoonists and the uh, people working the board in the other room in the mm. studio while Robin was doing that. Because according to the to the way that story was told. Nobody was really running the board at that point. They were all in hysterics, fits of hysterics. <laughs> what he was you know, just riffing on, on endlessly, 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 and wondering to themselves, how on earth are we going to fit all this into a movie? <laughs> 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 and I imagine probably something similar happened with uh, when Will Smith was playing the role, although obviously mm-hmm. he played it differently, but still. Yeah. Yeah, you, you just keep going and going and going, and, and mm-hmm. it's like it's like a wind up toy. It's like yeah. the ever ready battery. You know, it's the it's, it's the ever ready bunny. <laughs> <laughs> just keeps going and going and going. <laughs> oh man! What we're talking about here, I believe, is the true essence of what source energy is. Yeah, we are mm-hmm. all source energy. We come from source energy. We make this material world from source energy. Mm-hmm. And source energy is just the term that we use to describe the fact that everything is made up of energy. Mm-hmm. Well, 
that what we're experiencing here is the essence of energy. When we experience death, we're experiencing the essence of energy. We, we notice that someone is no longer here. Right. And at least not in the physical realm. They're mm-hmm. still here in the energetic realm. That never stops, but we notice that they're not here in the physical realm. Yeah. And in that noticing, that's when we experience the grief. That's when mm-hmm. we experience the pain, the separations, the agonies, the reliefs, the old, thank God, I thought she'd never die. <laughs> <laughs> But we experience all of that through the energy, and, and the common and the common thread through all that energy is emotion. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, emotion is what drives the whole thing. And there, once again, I'm thinking about Abraham Hicks's teaching, because Abraham teaches that emotion is what we feel when our physical selves are in or out of alignment with our spiritual selves or our eternal selves or our inner beings or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And that when I first heard that expression, that one caught me by surprise. That made me really think about it a lot and made me realize, wow, emotion is an amazing thing. Emotion truly is where the creative power is mm-hmm. because we do all our creating in the physical world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we create the physical world. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like, mm. whoa. Well, and I'm a good deal of the non-physical, too. Mm. Uh, we, we, do, we do create some of the non-physical as well because we do attract to us. Um, I mean, I, I have a, a client who, uh, has, who has strong emotions and has a very strong belief in ghosts. Mm-hmm. And so this person is literally creating ghosts. They're, they're literally, and, and it's, it, it, whatever emotion this person's feeling, it literally creates the ghost experience. Well, you know, everything mm-hmm. from voices to, uh, and I had one client where things were literally flying off the walls. Mm-hmm. And what it was was not necessarily that, yes, they were connecting with a little bit of non-physical, but all, most of it, they were just creating themselves. They, this is the expectation that they had, and they had such a strong emotional connection to it. They were so afraid of it that it created this whole world. Mm. And once we were able to clear that, once that, once that was, we were like, no, no, the world isn't like that. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> no, no, you really are the creator here. Um, and we can change this story. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, the ghosts went away. Mm. Sure, and it was like, well, were they there? Were they ever there before? Well, yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, of course they were there because we created them, or that person right. created them, so right. they were there. Yeah, and, and because you created them, you can uncreate them. Yes, <clears throat> and it's- you can and you can do that with with um, a lot of the work that Nina and I are doing is uh, working with uh, uh, what they call fourth dimensional reality. And it's really, really deep work. I mean, I won't get into detail with it because it's, it's really, really interesting. Uh, but she had an interesting experience because we've been doing this work. She was doing an acupuncture cl- uh, treatment on somebody, a pain treatment. And so she put the needles in. She, uh, she left the room to work on another patient. And she came back, and she came back to take the needles out. And, uh, you know, she took the needles out, and she stopped for a moment. She's like, wait a second, I could have swore I put needles in that person's legs. And the patient was like, "Aren't you going to take the the, the, uh, the needles out of my out of my legs?" And she's like, "The needles aren't there." So, in the moment that she was putting the needles in, they had both had a shared experience of the needles going in. Mm-hmm. The needles actually existed in a fourth dimensional space. They created it with the energy, and once the energy was used to do whatever they were do- what it was doing, they kind of like disappeared from reality, which is wild. This is, this is the only time this has ever happened. This is just, it is just wild, wild stuff. And so in essence, they created, she was, as she was putting the needles in, she was actually energetically creating the needles. Okay. But what, what you're actually describing has a, t- a term now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's called VR. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that is. VR. My son, we gave our son a VR headset with the play, for the PlayStation, mm. and we're playing Beat Saber now. Mm-hmm. Which is, is, is you take these lightsabers yeah. and you you hit the beats, 
And I put that thing on the first time. I was like, I've waited my whole life for this video game. <laughs> it is the coolest yeah, in the is. whole freaking world where yeah. you are literally transported to another world mm-hmm. where you are doing this video game. If you haven't tried it, I recommend it. <laughs> I recommend it because, again, it it's a, a visceral experience of... Um, the, what it's like to create your own reality. Mm -hmm. It is where you are actually in a place when you're not really in that place, but you, but because you're, you're visual and you're peripheral and you're above and you're below is all immersed into this. It becomes part of your reality. And then you, then when it comes to visualizing, you go into those deep meditations and you think about being somewhere else and experiencing somewhere else. Now you got some, now you got a hook. Now you can actually visualize that because you've been there before because when you had the headset on, now you can do it. Now you can do it in deep meditation without the headset. Mm-hmm. But, you know, having, and, and also they're, they're starting to come out with meditations with VR. So that you can be literally in the place while I you're think going that into meditation. Is I need because I I just can't do it by myself. I need help. <laughs> but but isn't that cool? How the technology yeah, yeah. is um helping us get to that place. That's, right. That's just so, freaking cool. <laughs> so I got to ask you guys. I'm going to ask the question that Linda Armstrong asks. Okay. Isn't it true that we're already in the Matrix? She says. That's yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> no doubt in your mind whatsoever. No doubt whatsoever. <laughs> None. In, that, in that reality, you know, when Neo is creating the reality here, you know, he's able to literally create the reality. And if you are in tuned enough with your energy and you are in tuned enough with your emotions, because emotions are important, is one of the most important element to that creation process. Mm-hmm. You can, if you can get to that point, yes, absolutely. And, uh, that's what they call fourth dimensional creation. Uh, Yogananda told many stories uh, in this, uh, in doing this, where people would literally, you know, you go pineapple and there's a pineapple in your hand, and then you, boom, it's gone. Uh, there was these stories of these uh, yogis up in the Himalayas who created these golden palaces out of just thought energy, and then they would have these ginormous feasts in these palaces with pe- people were actually eating food that they just created out of nothing. And then after the feast was over and everyone went home, the, the palace disappeared and, the, and everything. It was, it was just no longer necessary. <clears throat> well, it's an interesting way to attack world hunger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that scene in the movie hook where they, where they were eating. I don't even know what they were eating, but they imagined it was like a whole Thanksgiving feast. Yes. Great, great movie. Yeah. <laughs> Except that their feast all looked like Play-Doh. Right. Yeah, I know, right? I was like, <laughs> but, mm, but what's happening here? <laughs> food, food is energy. Mm. And, if you, and, and if you believe it's, it, it's going to be good for you, you believe that it's, it has energy to nourish you, it will, even if it's... I, actually, you know, I was thinking, does it, is it going to taste good? Yeah. <laughs> so again, that's if you believe it is? Again, it's perception. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what I was saying. It looked like Plato to me. If it, if it looks like Plato to me, it's not going to taste real good. <laughs> right. yeah, we've been Unless watching the original Star Trek series uh, recently, and whenever they yeah. have the plates of food, it's just these colored pieces of Plato. It's like, oh yeah, that looks appetizing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! They, they gave us a speech too about how all of the essential ingredients that the human body needs are found in this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which somebody, one of the characters would reply, "Yeah, but what about enjoying the food?" <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> this is where I think Abraham Hicks really has it right. Why do we come into the physical world with all the pain and the suffering and the angst and not knowing how the whole thing works? We're just submerged in this thing. We've forgotten all of our past lives. We've forgotten how source energy works. We've forgotten how LOA works. Why do we do all that? And their answer is chocolate. chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> what does chocolate taste like? What are colors like? That's why we come here. We come yeah. here to experience, to live, and, to enjoy. And the discovery and the rediscovery. And remembering, we come here to remember, mm-hmm. because the because the act of remembering is joyful. 
the act of the when we remember about our past lives when we remember when we remember about how the universe works and we be, then we start to experience it there's a lot of joy attached to that it's like ah oh, i remember now and now mm. you've got more of an experience now you have a more of an experience as a deliberate creator which is is a lot of fun do you agree with that, Alex? I, I, I ask you because I'm, I'm withholding my opinion for the moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, to a point, I believe it, but I, I don't think it's one of the main points is why we're here. I agree with the whole chocolate theory. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, if, if chocolate was the only reason to come here, it would still be worth it. Back. <laughs> Back. <laughs> Until you turn 32 and realize you're now allergic to chocolate. <laughs> well, oh, no! Yeah, man. Yeah, it's the worst. Uh, and Carob <laughs> is no replacement. No! <laughs> no! God, no. <laughs> but it's the worst because it's like for the first 32 years of my life, I was living the chocolate dream. And then... Uh, they were like, yeah. nah, yeah, not I had the experience. It was like, yeah. okay, we're done. You're done with that experience. You got to look for something else. You can't just be eating chocolate all the time, Alex. Well, it's like, <laughs> is it better to have loved and lost? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's telling you there's something better. <laughs> what is better than chocolate? Well, white chocolate, actually. <laughs> I could have white oh, chocolate. No, I, li- I like dark chocolate better. It's much, much no, more No, no, I was always a milk chocolate chick. I was always a milk chocolate, but now I'm onto, I'm onto white chocolate. No, no, not milk chocolate, dark chocolate. Yes. Yeah, no, no, and I'm saying I was into milk chocolate. Oh, I, you were into it. Oh, I, can't I see. Stand oh, okay. dark chocolate. Yeah. Oh, okay. 70 to 75% cacao is primo. Is that, that's that, well, that's more than I, I like it in the 60 to 65. That's range, too still. much. Yeah. That's too much. Yeah. No, water it down all you can for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not that and I don't actually, like milk chocolate, chocolate, by the way. And chocolate actually is uh, cacao is is one of the uh, uh, has one of the highest nutrition values as a, mm-hmm. as, a as an herb than m- almost every other herb on the on the planet. Mm-hmm. So if I were you, Alex, I think I'd make it a goal to reacquire your ability to eat chocolate. Oh, I'm still eating it. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. I'm just not having good results. <laughs> no, it, Oh, well, then you're halfway there. All you got to do now is just change the mindset. You're, you'll be there. Well, you'll be I, I've the semi changed the mindset. Like whenever, um, not to be gross, but whenever I need chocolate. <laughs> ah, yes. You know what I'm saying? Then, yes. then I'm like, oh, great. I get to have a candy bar because, you know, things have stopped moving. So <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, get things going again. Let's uh, get on the chocolate train. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Definite pattern going on there. You might want to look at that one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you got to get your promos in, sir. Oh, my goodness. We're out of time, aren't we? I got to get a promo we in. We are. Yeah. Okay. Well, first and foremost, you can tell, I mean, every episode is different. How often do you get an episode about the host's wife or, or mother dying? Not wife, please. No. I mean, my mother dying. <laughs> That's another, that's another show. That's another let's show. Not, let's not. not that, that, that one's for like 50 years from now. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> Facts. No, I mean, this, this has been a, a really good show to talk about because I think it's it's a topic that affects a lot of people. A lot yes. of people really get dragged down about it, so I'm really glad that we talked about it. But this is an, just one example of the kinds of things that you get when you subscribe to the show. So become a subscriber. First of all, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Second of all, we got five of them a week that we're doing. Well, actually, during the summer, it's about three. Um, and you know, <laughs> third, why do you need a third reason? There's two good reasons right there. So just go to... <laughs> Just go to LOAToday.net homepage, and right at the top, you'll find instructions on how to subscribe using your particular device. Um, and then, you know, once you subscribe, make sure that you share with others on social media and, and even off social media. Offline is a good way to talk, by the way. Um, you know, share with people in all the different ways. And feel free to tune in and watch us as we record this, because we record live stream to YouTube, and you can actually watch the live stream or the replay on YouTube. And I always turn to my friend Alex because she explains YouTube so much better than I do. So how do they subscribe? Well, you can subscribe by going to LOA Today podcast videos on YouTube. And once you're there, you just hit the subscribe button. And next to the subscribe button, there's a little bell. And make sure you click always so you will always be notified when we're live. And it's just that simple. And uh, also, i got to get a couple of your promos in. So, Bill, where, where are you speaking next? What's the next event on your calendar? Uh, the Mind, Body, Soul Expo in Saratoga Springs. I'll be there not this coming weekend, but the following weekend. I'm there. I'll be doing a speaking engagement from 12 to 1, and I'll be there with my booth both days, giving SRT clearings, and and we're actually going to be 
selling these little guys at our at the at the booth too, which is our little Sids from the Suburban Monk. Ah, okay, sounds good. And any spoilers we need to know about Alex? Um, brum, brum, brum. let me see. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Oh, there was one. What was it? Mm. Uh, the latest episode of Claws. Ah. Yeah, yeah. It was it was rough. It was heartbreaking. So mm. definitely, definitely. Uh, if you haven't started watching Claws, you should. We're only in season three, so you should definitely start watching it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, there's an endorsement right there, and also an endorsement too. We're going to be coming out with a second episode of The Grass Is Greener, mm-hmm. where it is in development at this point. I can't tell you exactly when it's going to be released, but it will be released hopefully very soon. So that's something to look forward to. Thank you guys for uh, sharing this uh, little tribute to my mom. I appreciate it very much. Thank you to our podcast listeners as well. And we will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Very strange, silly people here.